Hey what's up folks, it's Chili here, I make fan content for Age of Empires 4. This video is for the folks who are new to the game or are curious about Age of Empires 4 and are wondering why there's been so much hubbub about a game that has died years ago. Well for context, I work professionally as a game designer and developer and I've also played AoE 4 enough to get a decently high rank so I have quite a few thoughts I'd like to share. Nowadays I'm probably what you'd call a super fan but it wasn't always this way so in this video I want to cover the top 5 things about Age of Empires 4 that won me over. Before we get started, if you like my content, I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a like and subscribe as it'd really help me grow this channel and deliver you guys more videos. Alright, let's get back into it. To start off, let's take a trip down memory lane. Look, if you thought this game was dead, I get it, for a time, it basically was dead. Back when it was first announced in 2017, we hadn't seen a new entry into the series for over 12 years. In fact, RTS, that's real-time strategy if you're unfamiliar, as a whole was in a pretty sorry state, with less than just a handful of companies keeping the entire genre afloat. So when the news came out that not only were we getting a new numbered entry for the Age series, but also that it was being developed by none other than Relic Entertainment, the studio behind the critically acclaimed and one of my favorite games of all time, Company of Heroes, oh man, people were hype. I was hype, my friends were hype, we all had fond memories of the Age of Empire series from our childhood, and now that we're older and we have a bit more disposable income and employer-proof free time, we would soon finally be able to revisit a time when life was simpler and a little bit more innocent. That was long ago. Today, Atlantis' enemies live only in my dreams. And then the first screenshots came out, and the game looked honestly rather silly, with all these garish cartoony graphics and absolutely ridiculous proportions. And then they announced the sieves, and disappointingly there were only 8 of them. This is a far cry from the absolutely massive 39 sieves available in AoE 2 at the time, or even the 20 sieves available in AoE 3. So what was once hype had now seriously diminished, and to many, Age of Empires 4 was starting to look more and more like a cash and grab mobile game rather than a proper canonic entry into this legendary series. But even as my friends dropped off, I still held out hope that the game could still be good. And so I got the game on launch, and boy was it a disappointment. The UI looked half-baked, pings and alerts firing off everywhere completely overwhelming me, game mechanics that were clearly unfinished and broken, and there was just a total lack of unique units, and bugs, bugs everywhere, and exploits everywhere too. Look where this stupid shit is. <laughs> yeah. Holy moly. I immediately uninstalled and refunded my purchase. It was one of the worst releases I'd ever seen, and for a while this game faded into memory for me. Fast forward to a year later, AoE 4's Anniversary Edition was released. It was clear that Microsoft saw how abysmal the launch was and initiated the emergency protocol. Free, free DLC. DLC. New sieves, new maps, bug fixes, and more. All free. And even with all that, it still took me a while to take any real interest, but eventually I finally caved in and gave it one more chance. And I gotta say, the experience was night and day. It really didn't take long for me to get completely hooked. So what exactly managed to convince me? Let's get into it. Number 1. Sound Design for anyone that's a fan of AoE 4, this one should be a no-brainer, but honestly, it did catch me by surprise initially. The game sounds absolutely incredible. It's probably one of the best audio experiences in any strategy game that you can get on the market right now, which makes sense considering that this is Relic after all. The sound design in Company of Heroes was honestly the stuff of legends. And it looks like they were able to bring that same quality to AoE 4, bringing these medieval battlefields to life. From the moment you open up the menu and select your civilization, you'll hear a unique rendition of the game's classic theme based on the faction that you selected. It shows an absolutely amazing attention to detail. Pick the Chinese and you hear some beautiful Urhu. Pick the Mongols and you hear that classic throat singing. Pick the Malians and you'll straight up hear R&B. Just kidding, I actually like the Malian theme the best. Once you get into a match, every faction has unique peacetime and wartime themes that also evolve seamlessly as you progress through the ages. It's seriously such an immersive experience. When you hit the Imperial Age of the French, you'll hear this. It's like I can suddenly feel the wind on my face as I'm galloping through the French countryside with a Disney castle in the backdrop. Or, oh man, my favorite one is actually the Roost combat theme in the Imperial Age. first time I heard this, I was like, oh yeah, these guys become Russia. And suddenly I was commanding conscripts again and fighting for the Royden. Hoorah! Ahem. <clears throat> Aside from the music, the sound effects are also on point. Hearing the thundering of hundreds of hooves trampling through your base is honestly the stuff of nightmares. As well as the sound of siege engines, I remember the first time that I heard the loud groans of a whole line of trebuchets launching those 90 kilogram projectiles across 300 meters. Absolutely iconic. 
Cannon fire from bombards and arquebusers also sound fantastic, especially when they're echoing the distance off screen. For me, this brings back fond memories of the artillery from Company of Heroes. My favorite aspect of the sound design, though, doesn't even fit in this category. It's best if we put it in the next category. Number 2. Historical Authenticity The Age of Empires series has always had a dubious relationship with history. AoE 2, for example, mostly had rather broad and basic references to history, and a lot of it was pretty inaccurate. So for instance, the Koreans use a war wagon as a unique unit for some reason, and the Japanese literally have a technology called kataparuto, which is literally just a Japanese way to say catapult in English. Historically, the Japanese barely even used catapults, so why do they have a tech that buffs their trebuchets? It all makes zero sense. But I get it, AoE 2 was an old game, and it was made long before the days of Wikipedia and YouTube historians like Matt Easton, and I don't want to give you guys the wrong idea. By no means is AoE 4 an accurate historical simulation, but this is the first game in the series where I can see some serious attention to detail when it comes to how the historical thematics affect your in-game experience. One example is voice lines. This is a series known for its voice lines. Some of the most iconic memes in the game's industry as a whole come from the voice work from the Age series. <laughs> And Age of Empires 4 takes it to a whole new level. Rather than just short, awkward phrases, and if you can understand the languages, you know how awkward it comes off. Yes, what is your command? I'll do it. I'm going now. Right. We can now actually hear full conversations presented in a much more natural way. On top of that, every single unit in the game has its own unique voice lines, and the words they're saying isn't just gibberish, but rather the voice actors are actually speaking as accurately as possible to the language of the specific time period. That's right, the time period. Every single faction's unit voice lines evolves through the ages, so you can go from an ancient Chinese in the beginning of the game to a more middle-sounding Chinese, to something that sounds much closer to modern Mandarin by the end of the game. For fans of linguistics, this is straight up linguistic porn. If you're curious to learn more, I think this creator does a really great job of diving into this based on his understanding of medieval German and Chinese. It's a really interesting watch and honestly it's one of the videos that had convinced me to get into the game. Aside from the voice lines, there's also a lot of visual details as well. So for instance, most of the architecture in the game is modeled on real historic buildings. For buildings that aren't standing today, the devs actually did their own interpretation of it based on historical documents. You also have units in the game that will wear armor that's accurate to our latest historical understandings. And yeah, there's a few mishaps here and there. And I honestly wish they would patch them, but it's all relatively minor in the grand scheme of things. If you guys are interested, I'll probably make a video down the line to cover all the historical idiosyncrasies in the game, so let me know if that's something that you're interested in. On top of the visuals, each Civ also has unique technologies and traits that also take a lot of thematic inspiration from real history. So for instance, China famously discovered gunpowder far before any other nation, as early as the 9th century CE in fact. So naturally, Chinese structures defend themselves with gunpowder weapons even in the early game. Another one is the Mongol Yam Network. Historically, the Yam Network was used to quickly relay messages across their vast territory. In game, Mongol outposts actually boost the movement speed of their units. There's so much more to say on this, it's actually better if I wrap this into the next point as well. Number 3. Civilization Diversity Yes, when Age of Empires 4 first launched, I was pretty underwhelmed. Only 8 civs, and where were all the unique units? When I was browsing the website, it looks like there was only a couple units in each civ. For a history fan like me, this was just not a very robust offering. And personally, I'd never been a fan of how AoE 2 civs all had the same generic looking units. It kind of feels like there's so much colorful history that's being lost when every civilization has a frankly Eurocentric looking roster. This is not how I would imagine a medieval Vietnamese soldier looking. On this though, I'm happy to say that Relic proved my initial impression wrong. Yes, there are a lot of generic units that every faction has access to, such as the Spearman or the Scout or the Archer, but I'll reiterate, every single one of these units has a unique model. Not only that, but just like the voice lines and the music, these models also evolve as you progress through the ages. This is for every unit for every faction. So at least aesthetically speaking, you could think of every unit as a unique unit in this game. What's more, certain civilizations have unique technologies that further make your units unique. Let's take for example the men-at-arms. These guys are basically your generic armored infantry. They're tanky, they wield a sword and a board. But if you're playing as the Holy Roman Empire, you can upgrade your men-at-arms to wield a two-handed mace, which gives them bonuses that make the unit play completely differently from every other men-at-arms in the game. Another example is the knight for the Rus. Knights are generic armored cavalry units, but for the Rus, they have access to knights earlier than other civs, and they have unique upgrades that give the knights bonus health as well 
well as a really badass looking poleaxe. On a side note, I recognize that there's been a healthy debate regarding the historical authenticity of using a poleaxe on horseback. I personally think that there's enough evidence here suggesting that this was a thing that I am partial to accepting it, if nothing else as a rule of cool, because it really does look really good in game. Anyways, my point is, is that when it comes to unique units, the unit rosters are deceptively diverse across all the different civilizations. Many seemingly generic units not only have their own unique look, but also play as if they're unique units. There's also a lot of diversity when it comes to the structures. Not only can you build these landmarks that look really unique and cool, but they're also integral to the faction's playstyle and identity. So for instance, the French can build the Cavalry School in the Second Age. This allows them to pump out royal knights very quickly, naturally gravitating the civilization towards early aggression. In contrast, the Holy Roman Empire has the Aachen Chapel, which makes nearby villagers gather much faster, meaning that the HRE is typically more focused on economy early on. AoE 2 may have a ton of civilizations, but most of them play very similar to each other. They all roughly share the same units and the same technologies, which means that there's a lot of overlap in the kind of experience you're going to get whether you're playing one faction or another. AoE 3 does have quite a lot of diversity, but a lot of it is also fluff. Unique units that have small tweaks here and there but don't actually feel that special, home city cards that are marginally different from one another. It's colorful, but also puts a huge amount of burden of information on the player. AoE 4, in contrast, truly has civs that play completely differently from one another, and honestly, I think it's quite a streamlined design. Limiting the number of unique units lessens the burden of information on the player base, which naturally helps new players learn the game better. And I love how the differences between the factions are really limited to just a handful of unique traits, landmarks, and units. But from this small handful of differences, there's a ton of branching playstyles to explore. One thing I really like about this game is that the competitive space is constantly innovating. Sometimes a completely new, broken strategy will appear out of nowhere that was hiding in plain sight the whole time. Now, there's one more crucial thing I'd like to add to the fashion diversity point, but I'm actually such a big fan of this feature that I think it deserves its own slot. Number 4. Base Building and Influence Age of Empires has always been a two-pronged experience the battlefield and the base. Past games in the series focus on unique units and combat mechanics that make fighting on the battlefield more diverse and interesting, but not as much emphasis was placed on the base building side in my opinion. In fact, you'd often just haphazardly toss your buildings wherever it was convenient for you. AoE 4 is the first time I experienced something totally different, and that's because of the influence system. For me at least, this is the best building mechanic I've seen in a real-time strategy game. Basically, each faction has a specific building type that will emit an influence zone. This influence zone will grant bonuses to other structures that are also built in the same zone. So for example, the English mill has an influence zone that that boosts the effectiveness of all the farms placed around it. The Malian pit mine generates gold passively based on the number of houses placed around it. What this means is that as you're playing the game, you're constantly thinking about how you want to best lay out your base to maximize your influence bonuses. And since the map is procedurally generated, each game is like a new base building puzzle. And you get rewarded for how creatively and efficiently you can plan out your base. What's really cool about this is that every civilization lays out their base in their own completely unique way. A French base will look completely different from an English one, which will look completely different from a Chinese one. Honestly, sometimes I find myself just pausing to look around and appreciate everyone's bases. Now, it's one thing to know your civilization well enough to be able to build the optimal base layout, but it's another thing to actually be able to get it done in a competitive match. Let's take the Ottomans for example. Their production structures, barracks, stables, archery range, etc. will produce much faster when they're placed around a blacksmith. But in order to maximize this bonus, you need to space out your structures so that you can fit as many production buildings as possible within the influence zone. But against a competent opponent, they're not going to let you get away with that. The more your base is spaced out, the harder it is to defend. And what good is an influence bonus if your structures are always getting destroyed? And Instead, in competitive play, we often see base layouts that creatively work within the constraints of both, wanting to maximize value while also ensuring that structures are well protected. This means less real estate, tighter base design, and evolving the layout of your base based on the tides of the match. This all feeds into the final and most important thing that won me over about this game. And that's number 5, Emergent Gameplay. This is the coolest aspect of the game in my opinion, and it's what makes me really respect the design of AoE 4. On a base level, the mechanics of Age of Empires 4 are way simpler and more straightforward compared to past titles. I'll use AoE 3 as an example. To learn AoE 3, you have to be familiar with every faction's home city cards and unique units, which can easily be hundreds of cards and hundreds of units, all with just slightly different percentage values here and there. This is a lot of burden of knowledge for new players, and it makes the game incredibly hard to get into. In contrast, in AoE 4, each civilization only has a handful of unique traits, six landmarks, and just a few unique units and technologies. Unlike AoE 3, and this is the point that I'm trying to drive home this whole video, is that the differences are far more impactful, and it creates a ton of opportunities for emergent gameplay. And for the folks that aren't familiar, emergent gameplay is when really complex scenarios arise from relatively simplistic mechanics. It allows a game that's seemingly easy to learn to have a lot of depth and actually become quite difficult to master. A great example is the Aachen Chapel. I mentioned this one earlier. It's a Holy Roman Empire landmark that boosts nearby villager gather rate quite significantly. Now where you choose to place this landmark will heavily impact how 
how the match will play out. The Akinchapa only boosts within a limited radius around it, so you want to catch as many resources as possible. But the way the map is procedurally generated, the gold is not always next to the stone, which is not always next to the food or the wood, and so on. So which resource do you want to prioritize? If you place it next to the stone, you can build more town centers earlier and boost your economy. But if you place it next to the gold, you can maybe try to age up way quicker. And if your opponent scouts you out and sees what you're doing, they'll have to adjust accordingly. What's awesome about this is that there's no rule in the game that says, this is how this should work. The mechanic is stupid simple. It's a building that boosts resource gathering within a limited radius around it. But the ways in which the player decides to wield this tool opens up a wealth of dynamic interactions in the game, which also really allows for players to express their personality through their strategy. Alright, that about covers it. So in summary, I was pretty critical of AoE 4 from the beginning, but the aspects that ultimately won me over are Number 1, God Tier Sound Design Number 2, Attention to Historical Authenticity Number 3, Factions and Civilizations that each have their own completely unique playstyle Number 4, A way more compelling base building experience thanks to the influence system And Number 5, Emergent Gameplay Simple baseline rules that interact meaningfully to produce a ton of depth for the record, I'm actually not all sunshines and rainbows about this game. I do also have a lot of criticisms. I'll probably post about those in a follow-up video sometime. But if you are in the market for a high quality RTS, and you're on the fence about AoE 4, I highly recommend you try giving it a shot. Especially once a new Sultan's Ascent expansion comes out in the next month, which will add 6 new civilizations to the current 10. But I think the game right now is in a great state, and it honestly deserves way more recognition. Alright, I've gushed enough about this game. That's all from me for now. Stay frosty, stay chilly.